Welcome to Once Upon a Coin, documenting the ongoing history of blockchain and cryptocurrency. And as always, I'm your storyteller, Jason Cassidy. Today's story has us continuing our journey through the early days of crypto when nothing was guaranteed yet, which meant that the possibilities were truly endless if you're willing to jump in head first and take a chance on something new. This is a time when future titans of industry were being born and the mainstream media finally began paying attention to the blockchain world. Some of the craziest moments in cryptocurrency history took place here. Fortunes were made and then lost, and for a select few, their name was permanently etched into cryptocurrency lore. This is the story of crypto in 2012. Sun cast a shadow, a digital line is coming over the mountain and over your mind. What a wild ride this episode is going to be, because some of the most relevant and pivotal events in cryptocurrency took place in the year of 2012. One of the trends that emerged was the awareness around blockchain technology, with people finally beginning to appreciate that it was this that was underpinning all the cool innovations that was happening on top at the crypto level. Another trend was that the media was paying closer attention to Bitcoin, and that was a direct consequence of the eye-watering price action that took place the year prior in 2011. With this in mind, the events we're about to explore will make a lot of sense because the action came fast and furious as soon as the calendar flipped over to the new year. Want an example? Well, if you are someone who had not heard about Bitcoin yet, then you may have just got your first introduction to it via one of your favorite TV shows. This is because Bitcoin was featured heavily in an episode of The Good Wife that aired on January 15th, 2012. The name of that episode? Bitcoin for Dummies. Well, so, are you don't buy Bitcoin? No, you can. There are currency traders online. Yeah, one Bitcoin's worth $3. It used to be $33. People were hoarding. But that's not how it gets into circulation. You mine it, like gold. The guy who invented it created this program that releases blocks of Bitcoin over time. See? That means running software on your computer that works to solve complicated mathematical problems. So you can see that this probably caught a lot of people's attention around this time. This pretty much set the tone for the entire year as more and more people were now having crypto on their radar who had either previously never heard about Bitcoin or if they had heard of it before, they hadn't really assigned any real significance to it. I ran a printing company, but I also was involved in, in quite a bit of political activism. I had a friend, he knew I ran a printing company and, and said, hey, can you print me some posters? And he asked me if he could pay me in Bitcoin. So I allowed him to pay me in Bitcoin and that was my very first experience with it. When I wanted to then learn more about Bitcoin, it was uh, heavily dominated by people in the liberty movement. So for me, that was guys like Roger Ver or Eric Voorhees. And gosh, it just doesn't look like that at all anymore. I think of uh, digital currency group, Barry Silbert uh, or, or Larry Fink from BlackRock. So we're trying to fight to change the face of the global economy. And in some ways we've failed. I think a lot of battles we frankly have lost, but there's a lot of battles still to be fought. And so, I think there's still a lot of really important things that we can accomplish. A lot of people will look at the price of an asset to help determine its worthiness and the direction it's going in sentiment-wise, and Bitcoin is no exception. It started off the year at around $5 US, still coming back down to earth after the massive run-up in price that it had experienced the year prior. And while the price would need some time to recover from that early bull run, there were still some surprises in store for Bitcoin holders that they could wait long enough. But more on that a bit later. New projects were springing up all around the ecosystem now, and one such project saw the introduction of a name that would eventually find its way onto the Mount Rushmore of Cryptonauts, Vitalik Buterin. Why? Well, in May, he founded the now iconic Bitcoin Magazine, a publication that produced high quality physical copies of its issues. The magazines focused primarily on Bitcoin and were a major hit with the public upon launch. Buterin would eventually move on from Bitcoin to co-found Ethereum, which is the second largest cryptocurrency in the planet today. Just a month later, another company popped up onto the blockchain scene, one that would end up having a much bigger impact on the industry. Coinbase was founded by Brian Armstrong on June 20th, and it would go on to become one of the biggest cryptocurrency companies in history. 
Of course, it didn't start off this way though. And for the first few months after its creation, the company worked tirelessly at getting its funding together to prepare for a Q4 launch. Now, I've been a Coinbase customer since 2013, and I remember they were a Bitcoin first company. That was their, their motto. Now they're, I, I don't even know, have, have 100 tokens and assets, and they're primarily an Ethereum company today in a lot of ways. You know, they, they deserve a lot of praise for making Bitcoin simple to acquire for Americans. Uh, getting Bitcoin early was kind of a nightmare, and Coinbase very, very heavily uh, made, made that a much better experience for me. So they do deserve credit for that. So while Coinbase was getting ready to make a big splash later that year, another group was working on an arguably even bigger idea that they were getting ready to debut. And just what idea am I talking about? Well, none other than Ripple. The XRP ledger launched in June, championed by David Schwartz, Jeb McCaleb, and Arthur Brito. Interestingly enough, before the name Ripple was established, the group had decided on the name Newcoin as their backstop behind XRP. Shortly after, they were branded to the name OpenCoin before finally settling on the name that we know today in Ripple. Yeah, it's like I said, 2012 was a foundational year in that it helped some of the biggest brands in crypto get their start. Ripple is a great business model and a bad technology. I, I have thought that international settlement and interbank exchange has been one of the most powerful things that Bitcoin should have been doing. Now, Ripple was really smart to try to commercialize. I like their basic corporate strategy. I think it's very shrewd. People can say, wow, Ripple's working with MoneyGram. And then 18 months later, they sunset the program because it just didn't work because the technology didn't work. If you're curious about what Bitcoin was doing around now, well, not much. By July, the price had moved up to $8 US. And to many, it seemed like the currency had now permanently eclipsed the $1 USD threshold, but very few could be prepared for what was soon to come. As the dog days of summer drudged along, some news hit the market that really shocked a lot of people. And in retrospect, it's easy to see why. Up until now, all the crypto-worthy news was coming from entrepreneurs and innovators that were building something new, be it an exchange, an altcoin, or a cool new feature to support the blossoming Bitcoin economy. The very last place anyone expected a noteworthy development to come from was the glacially slow governmental sector. And yet, that's exactly what was about to transpire. In July, the government of Estonia sent shockwaves through the cryptocurrency sector when they announced they were adopting blockchain technology and integrating it into their digital ID system. This news turned heads for two distinct reasons. First, it put the term blockchain on the map for a lot of people who had no idea about the technological underpinnings for all existing cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin. But perhaps more importantly, it legitimized the entire movement in the eyes of many skeptics who for the very first time were seeing a fully functional government making public overtures about the power of blockchain technology to transform their country in the not so distant future. The world was now officially put on notice something as fundamentally important as a citizen's identification was about to be digitized in a secure and scalable way. And it was all made possible by the very technology that was underpinning Bitcoin and every other altcoin on the scene. Looking back, this decision made a heck of a lot of sense. Estonia is a small country, and generally speaking, the smaller the country, the smaller the government, the less red tape you have to deal with to get things done in a timely manner. The Estonian government had identified a nascent technology that, if adopted early enough, could give them a massive competitive advantage over other countries. And the bonus here is that it would simultaneously earn them the reputation of being, well, rather pragmatic. As the dust was settling from this major announcement, there was another historical event about to take place. The introduction of PeerCoin. Launched on August 19th by developer Sunny King, PeerCoin, or PPC as it's known by its ticker symbol, was announced on the legendary Bitcoin Talk Forum. And this wasn't just your regular cheap Bitcoin clone either. No, PeerCoin was bringing something new to the table. And that was the introduction of the proof of stake model, which became so popular it eventually outgrew PeerCoin and was adopted by hundreds of blockchains in the industry, including Ethereum, which would do it about a decade later. PeerCoin still exists today as the very first standalone proof of stake blockchain in history. And perhaps fittingly enough, it's evolved to the point where its coin has a rat version living on the Ethereum blockchain in the form of an ERC-20 token. And of course, this move was done to give PeerCoin access to the thriving token ecosystem that lives on the Ethereum blockchain. September saw some new additions to the space, this time in the form of some much needed support for Bitcoin. The Bitcoin Foundation was launched with the explicit goal of helping advocate the virtues of cryptocurrencies. 
the foundation would help with education around Bitcoin's massive potential while also working with regulators to help promote pro-Bitcoin legislation. This was a critically important step in Bitcoin's growth, as during this time period, most people that heard about Bitcoin didn't have a great opinion about it, as they were hearing most of the negatives from all the scams taking place in the industry. The mainstream media wasn't exactly doing any favors for the cryptocurrency space either, as the minimal reporting they were doing on the subject was often slanted towards skepticism. With the advent of the Bitcoin Foundation, the industry now had a dedicated body of knowledgeable people to sing the virtues of crypto while also helping address some of the shortcomings that would naturally result from the birth of a very new sector. As October came into focus, it was Coinbase's turn to make headlines again as they were indeed busy over the summer getting ready to open their business to the public. And they did just that on October 26th, launching their exchange which allowed for the buying, selling and storage of Bitcoin. They had successfully raised 600,000 US dollars in a seed round held the month prior in September in anticipation for the big event. And as we now know, the public fully embraced them and they remain the de facto choice for many cryptonauts around the world today. All of these historically relevant events taking place made an impact on the mindset that investors held towards Bitcoin. And how do we know that for sure? Well, simply put, the price. By August, Bitcoin had once again breached the double digit mark and was now safely over $10 per coin. And this time it was for good, as it would never again drop below this threshold. If you had been looking to buy Bitcoin in the single digits in US dollars, well, I got some bad news for you. You had now officially waited too long. The price hovered above the 10 US dollar mark for the rest of the year. If you've been paying close attention though, you could see there was something very, very big brewing just underneath the surface that would soon take place something that very few were prepared for, even experienced OGs. Not surprisingly, more good news trickled out in the remaining months of 2012. For example, in October, BitPay announced they now had over a thousand merchants accepting Bitcoin via their payment service. If you're around in crypto during this time, then you probably remember TerraCoin, which debuted on October 26th. While there were now alternatives to Bitcoin if you want to invest into cryptocurrency, there still weren't very many, and for a while, TerraCoin was one of the most popular altcoins you could diversify into. On a personal note, this is around the time that I was first introduced to Bitcoin. A good friend of mine was over visiting after work and mentioned how he knew someone that had purchased cannabis via the Silk Road marketplace and how seamless of an experience it was. I just couldn't wrap my head around how the transaction was being settled. I asked him if the buyer had sent out money in an envelope to pay for the transaction and he said no. The Silk Road marketplace was using a new digital currency called Bitcoin. After asking about a thousand questions, my friend told me, you'll have to do your own research because I don't know all the details. That sent me right downstairs to my PC and within minutes I had found the Bitcoin white paper. Well, suffice to say I was enthralled and I probably read that thing over a dozen times. I was absolutely mystified with what I was seeing. It really did look like someone had built a technology that could be the future of money. And this officially kickstarted my journey down the rabbit hole that is Bitcoin and blockchain. Within weeks, I had downloaded the Bitcoin QT client and was mining away, looking at the code base and trying to make sense of how the ecosystem was functioning. So while I never end up using the Silk Road marketplace myself, I do have to credit it for being the source of discussion that put Bitcoin into my consciousness. And to be honest, I've never looked back since. But enough about me, because we still have one more very important and historically relevant event to take place in 2012. One that would at least be in part a catalyst for what would become a completely mental year of 2013 when it came to cryptocurrency. And that would be the Bitcoin halving, a programmatically set event that takes place once every four years. On November 28th, the first ever Bitcoin halving event took place, seeing the block reward drop from 50 Bitcoin per block down to 25 Bitcoin per block. What this meant was that effectively, the issuance of new Bitcoin was just cut in half, making it twice as scarce. This had both real supply implications as well as psychological ones, as the crypto industry tried to digest what the heck just happened. The price of Bitcoin slowly began to reflect this, ending the year just above $13 US. Wow, what a pivotal year for not just Bitcoin, but the entire cryptocurrency industry. 2012 saw the introduction of some major entities like Coinbase and Ripple, cultural and foundational pieces like Bitcoin Magazine and the Bitcoin Foundation, plus the introduction of proof of stake via PureCoin. Yet, as monumental as all this was, it pales in comparison to what was about to take place in 2013. I got to live through this, and my god, if you thought the first few years of crypto were a rush, you hadn't seen anything yet, baby. 
And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at next with the story of crypto in 2013. Because what took place in that year is going to make most Netflix action movies seem like a tea party in comparison. I hope you enjoyed today's stroll down memory lane. Until next time, have fun and enjoy life, my friends. I'll be back soon with another incredible story to tell you.